This episode is brought to you by FX's The Veil, starring Elizabeth Moss. FX's The Veil is an international spy thriller that follows two women as they play a deadly game of truth and lies on the road from Istanbul to Paris and London. One woman has a secret, and the other has a mission to reveal it before thousands of lives are lost. FX's The Veil premieres April 30th, only on Hulu. Introducing Wondersuite from Bluehost.com, the tool that makes WordPress wonderful for everyone. Website creation is hard, but now with Bluehost, you can answer a few simple questions about your business and goals, and the Wondersuite tools will automatically lay out your WordPress website or store in minutes. Seriously. From there, you can customize your design, pick your brand colors, and add blocks. No custom theme or coding required. You'll get content suggestions that you can keep or revise. And with Yoast SEO built in, we automatically help you get found in search engines. From step-by-step guidance to suggested plugins to an AI-powered help bot, our built-in tools make WordPress wonderful for everyone. Whether you're a beginner or a pro, you can join over 2 million Bluehost users. Go to bluehost.com slash wondersuite. That's bluehost.com slash wondersuite. There's always a power dynamic in an interview, but I've I try to do more groundwork to invite them in for it to be a conversation. So it's not only sort of extracting, like me doing all that work and the person just feeling totally spent at the end of an interview. Welcome back to Working. I'm your host, June Thomas. And I'm your other host, Ronald Young Jr. Ronald, it is so nice to be chatting with you again. But tell me, whose voice, familiar voice, I should say, did we hear at the top of the show? That was Anna Sale. She is the Uh host of Death, Sex, and Money, which has recently relaunched as a part of the Slate family of podcasts. So it's like our sister podcast or cousin or nibbling. (laughs) (laughs) I imagine that most people who are listening to this show will be familiar with the wonder that is Death, Sex, and Money, but... For those who have not yet heard it, Ronald, how would you describe the podcast? Death, Sex, and Money describes itself as a podcast about things we avoid talking about and need to talk about more often. Hence Mm. the name of those taboo subjects that aren't exactly small talk fodder at a party. Indeed. All right. I am very excited to hear this interview. But say, do you have anything extra just for Slate Plus members? So in our Slate Plus segment, we tackle a little bit of the money section of Death, Sex, and Money. And I ask Anna about her relationship with money and what that looks like in her personal life. That leads us to touch a little bit about how she felt about the cancellation of the show before it was revived here at Slate and how that impacted her view of her own financial stability. It's really interesting to hear from her about this. But then we also talk about her favorite interviewer, someone that Anna looks up to. And I'm very, very excited for her to share that with you. You followed the advice that is implicit in the title of Anna's podcast, so (laughs) I cannot wait to hear that. And if you're a member of Slate Plus, you will hear that at the end of the episode. If you aren't, it is really easy to join. As a Slate Plus member, you get to hear extra segments on this show and others like The Culture Gab Fest and Care and Feeding, which is the parenting podcast formerly known as Mom and Dad Are Fighting. You'll get bonus episodes of podcasts like Slow Burn. And of course, you will never hit a paywall on Slate.com. To learn more, go to Slate.com slash Working Plus. OK, let's hear Ronald's conversation with Anna Sale. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Let's face it, sometimes multitasking can be overwhelming. Like when your favorite podcast is playing and the person next to you is talking and your car fan is blasting, all while you're trying to find the perfect parking spot. But then again, sometimes multitasking is easy, like quoting with Progressive Insurance. They do the hard work of comparing rates so you can find a great rate that works for you, even if it's not with them. 
Give their nifty comparison tool a try and you might just find getting the rate and coverage you deserve is easy. All you need to do is visit Progressive's website to get a quote with all the coverages you want, like comprehensive and collision coverage or personal injury protection. Then you'll see Progressive's direct rate and their tool will provide options from other companies all lined up and ready to compare so it's simple to choose the rate and coverages you like. Press play on comparing auto rates. Quote at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. Why don't you tell me who you are and what you do? My name is Anna Sale. I'm a journalist and I host the interview show Death, Sex and Money. And you're also an author, correct? I am also an author. I wrote a book called Let's Talk About Hard Things. I love it. I love it. Uh, let's start with a easy one. I'm wondering if you consider yourself to be a creative. I don't like to force a label on anyone, but do you consider yourself to be a creative person or a creative? I think I've heard it said both ways. I don't personally call myself creative as a noun. <laughs> <laughs> I think that speaks to like I think it speaks to the, my background and my career path. I I've always been um like a a worker. I've always been a staff employee. I didn't go to art school. Mm -hmm. I didn't come at audio making from a sort of artistic background. I came from a journalistic background. But of course the reason I love making audio journalism is because it's such a fun, creative process. Mm -hmm. I, I actually have just started really thinking about this fairly recently about what it is about audio, like what parts of me are an artist. And I've, during my break between working for WNYC and joining Slate, I had about five weeks of, of not having a job. And I found myself like spending a lot of time listening to music and I went to some like live music shows and and it really made me think a lot about how so much of the roots of what I do now started when I was like making mixtapes in my bedroom with my like boom box. I love that. Like, but I wouldn't have, I didn't connect that early on because I started in a very, in a conventional newsroom setting, I would cover, you know, press conferences and legislative hearings in West Virginia. And like, so it didn't look like DJ Anna, you know, but like so much of what we do at Death, Sex and Money is about timing and the pacing of even like how I choose to like come in with a follow-up question yeah. and pace my words. Like there's a real musicality to it um, that I like thinking about, even though it didn't occur to me for years and years. It's funny you say that because when I think about my own relationship with audio production, it, w it hasn't been until fairly recently that I even thought of myself as a creative noun or creative person <laughs> adjective. Uh, it's only been fairly recently that I've even looked at myself that way because I was just like, well, I'm just out here telling stories. Like, uh -huh. that's what I'm doing. And I could see the similarities between you as a journalist uh, just saying I'm just reporting the facts here. But I, I think, are you are you beginning to embrace that title as a creative person? Yeah, and I also am coming to appreciate, like what I what I think I'm distinctly good at as a journalist. What I'm proud of is I, I do think I'm really good at relational reporting, like relational interviewing. And mm -hmm. what I mean by that is like, you can throw me in a room, and I'm going to figure out a way to to kind of somehow forge some kind of, if, if I can speak the same language as the person, find some way in mm -hmm. to learn something and to kind of pull out an interesting story. And I think that that's also deeply creative work too. Yeah. But again, because maybe what I thought of as a capital A artist was like someone who, uh, you know, it's all about their grand genius ideas that they come up all on their own my kind of creativity doesn't look like that. I love that. 
my introduction to you was through, of course, the podcast Death, Sex, and Money, which was originally with WNYC, now is with Slate. So we have sister podcasts. We're siblings now. Uh, yeah. But for those who don't know you, can you tell me a little bit about your life before Death, Sex, and Money? What did you do? Sure. I started in public radio in 2005. Mm-hmm. That was my first job as a journalist. I started in the newsroom at West Virginia Public Radio, and I covered kind of, I was a general assignment reporter, and they taught me how to edit audio, and I would cover the state capitol. But even then, I can remember sort of, like, I I like covering the news. I found it exciting, and Mm -hmm. I liked the sense of service about it. But I would, I can remember, like, mid-legislative session being like, hmm, I think I need to go to Southern West Virginia and interview an old bluegrass musician just to like cleanse the palate, you know? So so I always have liked doing like a combination of hard news and things that speak to our moment and what's happening in our world. And then also just like really diving in deep for profile interviews. And so I did that in newsrooms in West Virginia. And then I worked for Connecticut Public Radio and worked in Hartford. And then I moved to New York City in 2009 when I was 29 years old. Mm -hmm. And I made my way into WNYC and started, I produced, worked producing uh, national radio shows. And then I got into the newsroom and was a reporter there and then pitched Death, Sex, and Money as a show idea in 2013. And I've been able to make it for 10 years now. Now, you glossed over that bit of WNYC reporting because you were specifically, you covered politics, right? I did, yeah. Can you tell me of any notable coverage you did in politics reporting? He said with a smile. (laughs) (laughs) Have I told you one of my proudest moments as a WNYC politics reporter? I would love Um, to hear it. (laughs) um, So I was a politics reporter and I did both. I I went all around the country in 2011 and 2012 covering, kind of talking to voters around the presidential campaign in 2012. And then in 2013, I covered the New York City mayor's race. And um, I don't know why I'm so proud of this moment, but I am. <laughs> I, I Part of that mayoral campaign, you may not remember, um, Anthony Weiner was one of the candidates running in the Democratic primary at mm-hmm. the time. And this was after he had left Congress because of a sexting scandal that mm-hmm. had come out. And so in the middle of the mayoral race, while he's you know launching this comeback, a second sexting scandal <laughs> breaks. <laughs> I do remember this. And so I was assigned to go to the press conference where it was not only Anthony Weiner, but also his wife, And it's like a national media story. It's a local media story. And I was sitting on the floor, like right in front of the the podium where they were. And they took a few questions and and, um, a bunch of people asked, you know, they were like questions about like the timeline of when, which sext happened when and Mm -hmm. how, and he'd said this before and was he lying then and that kind of thing. And I was just sitting on the floor being like, this man is running to run New York City. Like, he is asking the voters of New York City to support him to be their leader. Yeah. And we're not talking about that. And and then they they sort of turned to leave, both Anthony Weiner and his wife, Huma Abedin, at the time. And I, like, raised my hand sitting on the floor, and I have my headphones on. I, like, look like such a public radio dweeb. I, like, I'm kind of, like, have bad posture. And I just start screaming. I just say, like, why should we trust your judgment? <laughs> Why? Why should we trust your judgment? And I repeat it like several times as he, they're walking away. They kind of pause and look at me and then they t- keep going. And the reason I can remember the cadence of my question is because it was it was then in this documentary called Wiener um, mm. that was a, of this press conference. And and I think what I what I find kind of interesting about that moment is to me it makes me proud as a journalist that I was like, wait, what is this actually about? Yeah. Like, I don't really care about Anthony Weiner's personal life. I don't really care about his marriage. Like, yeah. the reason we care about this stuff is because it's, you know, at baseline, he's making some kind of character argument to, yeah. you know, as he runs to be our political leader. And nobody's asking him about that. 
when you showed me that clip, you showed it before you did a talk at Resonate in uh, last year, uh, which is a po- an audio conference that is held in Richmond, Virginia. But I remember I forgot I bragged about it there. You, too. you did. You showed it. You showed it to me because you didn't do it in the talk. You were like, if okay. we have time, I'll show this clip. And so you showed me this clip on this big screen, and it's 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 baby Anna Sale like shouting yeah. at Anthony Weiner. And I remember at the time being like, wow. That is a, a stark contrast in terms of like <laughs> how you're conducting interviews now, you know, and I, mm. I was wondering, it's not and it, that's not a criticism. I love it, to be clear. <laughs> but the, well, I was wondering, in terms of how you honed your style of interview, like in Death, Sex, Money, it's very, very like warm, very, very uh, vulnerable, which is like kind of my bag, you know. Do you feel like you developed that interview style from your work in political reporting or was this something that kind of like came as part of birthed with the show? I think I don't think of it as separate. Like, yeah. um, I think that's the way that I interviewed public officials, you know, mm. like I, I wouldn't do that. If Anthony Weiner hadn't been running for mayor, I wouldn't have shouted at him like that. And, and even when when. Like, I also, in that campaign, interviewed Bill de Blasio, who went on to become mayor of New York City. And it it was sort of, it was revealed by the New York Post that his father had died by suicide during Mm -hmm. the course of that campaign. And it's not something that his, I believe his kids found that out by an item that was placed in the New York Post. Mm -hmm. And the de Blasio campaign reached out to me and they said, he's going to talk about this one time and he will talk with you about it. And, And so I interviewed him about being the son of a dad who struggled with mental illness um, Mm -hmm. and depression and addiction and how that led to suicide and how that, how his family dealt with it. And that wasn't like a, I wasn't shouting at him. That Mm -hmm. was, that was like maybe like a death, sex and money style interview, even though he was a public official. So I guess I think that, that they're sort of related in that I, The reason I I pitched Death, Sex, and Money is I was like, I want to hear more conversation about stuff that's like where we're really trying to say what we mean and Mm -hmm. we're talking about what's actually happening. Mm -hmm. Because I would cover – I would talk to voters and I would do Death, Sex, and Money style interviews, you know, in outside campaign rallies or in parking lots at at shopping centers and ask people how they felt like things were going in the country. And I would hear these like really personal – stories and I would you know people would share with me and I and I thought that was like really interesting stuff and I wanted to make more of that the center of my journalism instead of you know pivoting immediately as you do in a politics story you know you'd say this voter says thinks this in this county in Iowa and this is representative of these polls and then you look at talk, write about the polls and you move on and it's the end of your story you know so I wanted to do more journalism where we where we like talked about what was really going on and what I think are the things that have actually the highest stakes in all of our lives, which is like how we treat one another, what our relationships are like with our loved ones, where we feel alone and vulnerable. Um, if we've got the money to take care of ourselves and our loved ones, and if not, what's getting in the way of that, you know, that kind of thing. I never, I never saw it as on the same spectrum until, like, you explained it well. Like, I, I think uh, I'm thinking in my mind, especially as someone like, you know, I make a, a deeply vulnerable podcast with uh, Wait For It. So, like, when I think about what it looks like to sit down and ask a question, my mindset is completely different when I'm, like, talking to my friends or someone else that I feel some sort of kinship with versus someone I feel like I'm, I'm uh, like you said, like a <laughs> public official where it's like, you have a responsibility here. And, like, I feel like my mindset is different. But I never thought of them as on the on the same spectrum, and I completely understand where you're coming from. I, I'm also wondering, like, when you dive into something that is deeply personal, like, death, sex, and money, you know, and you really want to have the real conversations. Did you feel like along the way when you're unpacking that type of vulnerability from people and asking those types of questions that you made any uh, missteps that kind of became the guiding force for how you actually wanted to engage in these discussions? You know, I think I've learned over time. I can remember this is actually before starting death, sex, and money. Um, I've always been like really interested in 
narrative, people's narrative. Um, and what I mean by that is like, if somebody's said like, I'll do an interview with you about this, I'll be like, okay, cool. But I want to understand that. I want you to retell the whole story. And I can remember this was, I was still in my 20s. I was reporting in Connecticut and I was doing a story about, I think it was, it was some kind of theater group that worked with incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women. And through it, I, I met this woman who had spent time in prison on a drug driving charge um, and had killed someone, I believe, in an accident. And I was interviewing her like before a rehearsal. And I was like, tell me what happened, you know, and interviewed her about the day that 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 happened. And I didn't get at the time, like, yes, this person had said, I want to do this interview with you because I'm proud of being in this theater production. And I didn't flag, like, I'm going to ask you these things about the, you know, what happened that day. If if you don't want to get into it, I understand. Like, I didn't do a sort of, like, setting the expectations of what the conversation was going to be. And I just was asking question after question. And I didn't recognize, I think, at the time as a young reporter that when a reporter is asking you questions, especially if you don't have a lot of exposure to the media, you feel like you have to answer them. Mm. And, you know, I remember feeling afterward like, oh, I think this was more than what she bargained for, this Mm -hmm. conversation, like the way I did this interview. And so I think that that's something I always think about is like, there's always a power dynamic in an interview and it shows up in lots of different ways, but like, I want to try to make explicit with the people I'm interviewing what we're doing and why and like where now I talk about, you know, before we start, you know, if I ask about anything that you want to talk about, you know, please say so. I also say like, if somebody comes up in the course of our conversation that's like not here, like Mm -hmm. let's talk about like how you want to deal with their privacy, Mm -hmm. you know, if I ask a question that seems like it's framed in a way that's not how you think about your own experience, like, please feel free to push back, you know, on the premise. Like, I try to have more, and it still doesn't, like, the power dynamic is still there, but I I try to do more groundwork to invite them in for it to be a conversation. Um, so it's not only sort of taking, extracting, uh, like, me doing all that work and the person just feeling totally spent and like they've just given and given and maybe given more than they intended to at the end of an interview. That feels like, like, especially when we're talking about personal or vulnerable details, it feels like something that's, that's almost impossible to be avoided, especially when you think about like, like you said, the power dynamic between being the, you know, the reporter or the interviewer and the interviewee. Even while you were talking about that, I began thinking about that on your behalf for our discussion uh-huh. right now. Uh, and I know, uh-huh. Uh-huh. I know we're both professionals. You know yeah. what I mean? So how do you? Uh, I, I guess I'm wondering, like, and because you've done some very deeply personal interviews on uh, on Death, Sex, and Money. Do you ever feel like you're you're working against your own kind of um, doubt or caution and and wanting to ask a question that maybe you Digging. shouldn't? But exactly, yeah. Uh, like, do you feel some sort of conflict? I think there's certainly a tension. Yes, you know? that's a better word. And at the same time, it's not only one one way. Like, it's not only bad to dig and be attentive because there's also – there can also be something really incredible that happens when when someone does feel you being really – precise in trying to understand what they've gone through and and really paying attention. And that also, that doesn't happen a lot in our lives where someone's like, let me really, really kind of try to be there with, go back there with you and understand what you went through. Um, But there are some hazards along with that. And, And I think the other tension is when you're a journalist doing these interviews with the intention of you know, collecting tape that's going to become something that you share with listeners. I'm also thinking about the listener and I'm thinking about what will the listener need to kind of hook their fingers onto the story? Like, 
Sometimes that's trying to elicit a scene so a listener can sort of be transported somewhere. And sometimes that's like pushing back. If, you know, I try to think about what a listener who might have had a really different experience might want me to say, Mm -hmm. you know. Or if somebody's talking about doing something that harmed someone else, like I think of somebody who's had that harm done to them listening along, like what would they want me to say to this person? So it's really like multidimensional. And I guess I've come to a place where it's like, I take this work really seriously. And I really, every interview, I do the best I can. I also, I've messed up before, and I'm going to mess up again. And when a listener or a reader or some, somebody like reaches out and says like, you, I wish you'd ask this, or I wish you didn't do it this way. It's like, you know, take it in. Like I try to be receptive to that and consider it. Um, and I try to, if somebody feels wronged by us in the editorial process, like that's, we we take a lot of care at our show to kind of communicate with people before, during and after a taping and before an episode comes out. So at least there's not, um, surprise, like we don't, you know, we're not gotcha people. There are gotcha reporters out there, but that's not the kind of work that we do. And even even like if a rerun is airing, we want to make sure people know like, oh, this thing that you recorded three years ago is going to be popping up in people's podcast feeds because, you know, you don't want to surprise people in that yeah. way. Just trying to be attentive. We'll be back with more of Ronald's conversation with Anna Sale. We've all been there. You have a question about your credit card. You call the number for help and can't get a hold of anyone. If only you had a Discover card. With 24-7 US-based live customer service from Discover, everyone has the option to talk to a real person anytime, day or night. Yep, you heard that right. A real person. Get the customer service you deserve with Discover. Limitations apply. See terms at discover.com slash credit card. This episode is brought to you by Wondery. With the launch of ChatGPT, Sam Altman and OpenAI reinvigorated our imaginations and fears of a world with artificial intelligence. While the company looked like a stunning success from the outside, a battle was brewing within on what the future of AI should be. Almost a year after launching ChatGPT, that battle erupted into a war when the company fired its charismatic CEO, Sam Altman. From Wondery, Business Wars is a podcast about the biggest corporate rivalries of all time. In the newest season, host David Brown digs into the philosophical differences within OpenAI that culminated in Sam Altman's shocking firing, the chaos that followed, and what it means for the future and safety of AI in the modern world. Follow Business Wars on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen early and ad-free right now by joining Wondery Plus. And for more deep dive and daily business content, listen on Wondery, the destination for business podcasts. With shows like How I Built This, Business Wars, The Best One Yet, Business Movers and many more, Wondery means business. Listeners, we want to hear from you. Every other Thursday on Working Overtime, we offer advice on how to get creative work done. So please tell us your challenges and let us help you. Drop us a line at working at slate.com. You can also send a voice memo to that email address or give us a ring at 304-933-WORK. And if you're enjoying this podcast, don't forget to subscribe to Working wherever you get your podcasts. Now let's return to Ronald's conversation with Anna Sale. Talk to me about the process of pitching an episode of uh, Death, Sex, and Money. Oh, there's so many different ways that a little idea comes to life. Um, We just had a pitch meeting earlier today. It can be from like... You know, someone might be like, I love this person and what they make. And I heard them say this one thing. And I think there's more opportunity to dig there. And let's just reach out. And I'm like, cool, let's try it. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, there could be something like, oh, there's this like big public policy question. What are some different ways we could come at this with people who are engaging with it from different angles? And then we kind of think about booking in that way. Um, sometimes it's somebody's written an interesting memoir and we're just like want to dig in with them about it. Um, it's, I think that's what makes the show so kind of, I had no idea when I was pitching it that I was giving myself this gift and giving our, our team this gift, but it's like such a flexible frame because the only thing that the show has to do is have someone's voice talking about something that you might feel some like isolation around. Mm-hmm. And there's a lots of different ways to make episodes about that. Like sometimes it's me doing a really, you know, in-depth interview with somebody. Sometimes it's a lot of different voices of people weighing in on some open question. Sometimes it's like, you know, a live variety show built around some theme around some kind of dynamic that happens in life. Like it's so f- flexible. And then you sort of go out and you, the team, and we all try to sort of like, well, who's, which bookings are coming through? What's the order of the taping? And then in what order are we going to process this taping? Because what's the like, you know, what's the ongoing conversation? What do we want it to be like in the feed? You know, if it's a few different people in a row who are, you know, people who have some kind of like media presence or they've written books, like we want to kind of then change it up with something really different, you know. And then we want to do like a famous person. And then we want to do a bunch of listener voices. Like it's really, to me, that's what makes it cool. It's like the variety. I'm wondering if like one thing I've struggled with, especially with Wait For It, was making something that's relatable that people really want to comment on. Um, And so they chime in. And sometimes I have people just dump their entire life story and problems on me Mm -hmm. uh, in a way that is like, you know, sometimes I can take it. Sometimes I'm like, you know what? I got time today. And I'll respond via email or Instagram or however they reach out. But I imagine doing a show that's like as wide reaching as Death, Sex and Money is that you are having some wild requests and questions and trauma dumping in your in your inbox. And I'm wondering, how do you care for yourself and kind of manage those expectations of people looking at you as a listening ear, but also being the human and a sale? I, I, it's not hard. Um I think sometimes it's like, oh, I wish I had time to write a thoughtful email response to everybody that that shares a story. Um, But I think maybe what doesn't feel, it doesn't feel like they're writing an email to me saying, Anna, I need your help. Can you help me with this thing? Because so much of the spirit of the show is like this idea of um, collective, like, comparing of notes Mm -hmm. so it's more like we're a place for you to share so i don't i don't feel this need to like solve anyone's problems Mm -hmm. i will say it is kind of strange like my my husband will point out like it's not very common that somebody sees me on the street and like knows what i do um but on the very rare occasions that i'm in like that somebody sees me and like Tells, wants to tell me that they listen to the show. Mm-hmm. My husband has observed that I'm very like, I like immediately want to like turn it. I don't want to talk about me with them or the show. I want to like understand who they are. I like start kind of doing a little mini interview. You did that and then me. I like, did you I? You did that to me. Yes. <laughs> we were, we were, I'm like, and it's funny because we met as colleagues. And I'm yeah. like, and I'm like, of course, I'm like, Anna Sale. Oh my God. <laughs> let me talk to you. And if you immediately was like, Hey, who are you? What's going on? I've heard of it. And I remember you knew who I was, which also freaked me out. She's like, oh, I love your show. You've done a great show. I'm like, what? How do you know I? But you immediately, f- it was like judo like, watching that yeah. happen. Yeah, <laughs> but I think that there's something that what he has said, what he's observed, because this this also would happen when we first moved to California, when I like had a little baby and like really, I didn't have a lot of friends and mm-hmm. I would complain about feeling socially isolated. And he's like, why don't you try to make friends with these people who tell you they like your work? And I was like, Yikes. Nah, that's too. <laughs> that's not it. I, I'm, I'm being like, I, so I think there's that distinction between my persona and my personness, um, my actual personness. 
Sorry, I did that to you, Ronald. I no, I was. Be like, it, it, did it feel good or did it feel? It like, felt great uh, because okay. one, because I like at the time, I like. Of course, I deeply admired your work, and I I feel like when you did it, I immediately recognized it because I've done the same thing, where people will come up and be complimentary of wait for it, and I immediately say, "Hey, what's your name?" And I like I yeah. find out their name, and I'm like, "Oh, what's going on?" And like, and I immediately want I want to shift it a little bit. I don't think I've turned it into a mini interview, but it wasn't <laughs> it was not bad feeling at all. It was like, "Oh, Anacel is taking an interest in me. This is great." <laughs> well, I am interested because aren't you like we do this work where you don't get to see it land mm-hmm. in anyone's lives, mm-hmm. and so I think there is this sort of like, "Well, who are you, and how did you like tell me about your life, and where did this?" podcast show up in your life like that's interesting to me because i don't see people consume the work ever it's like a little mini exit survey if you will and (laughs) i feel like (laughs) it it, it definitely works in that sense um as y'all are making the show now you know you have an opportunity and granted being being canceled is not really something that people when i say canceled i don't mean canceled in the uh connotative sense that we use it today but they literally canceled you mean really canceled <laughs> like i mean really canceled <laughs> but i mean like in most cases when people get canceled you don't really look at it as an opportunity to kind of like reinvent yourselves um do you think that this was an opportunity for you to reinvent the show in some ways and if so um how do you plan how how did you do that i, I mean it's funny there were days where I thought, like, okay, open up that Google Doc, Anna, and write your new strategic plan for your journalistic mission. Like, get clear about, like, what's the thing you're saying to listeners about what death, sex, and money is in 2024 that it hasn't been before. And I sort of went into, like, the the thinking about relaunching at Slate with that, with that premise. And then, then I sort of relaxed about it because the thing that, the thing that our show has always been is, you know, we've been, we've not been a seasonal show. We've been in continuous production since 2014. Mm-hmm. And we've always been experimental and sort of evolving as we go. And um, and so I like that about the show. So I, I kind of think there's not like a hard turn that's happening with this relaunch of like, we are this now in a way that we weren't before. But it's more like, you know, we're, our team is made up of some different people now. The world is different. America is different in 2024. I'm different at this stage of my life. I'm in my mid-40s now, and I'm a parent to two kids and uh, married. And when I started the show, I was, like, not a parent, not married, divorced, um, trying to figure out my career. Um, and and so the sort of, like, where I feel like I feel like the show was born out of this desperate search for like how to do grown up life questions. Like I felt like I needed guides and I needed assurances that I could have my life take turns that I didn't expect and still it was going to be okay. And I kind of in in midlife, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there are definitely more turns coming Um and but I I don't feel I'm more interested at this moment in like what's our relationship to one another in this democracy and in community and how do we take care of like friendships and even like co-working with each other when so many of us work apart from people we work with like how do we be in relationship when relationship is so weird now like partially in person partially not um how do we honor who we are as individuals and also figure out how to work together? Those are kind of like my existential questions. So I think that's like maybe going to be kind of like a thing that we dip into. But the biggest thing I think that's changed for me in this transition from getting canceled to getting reborn is like, (laughs) you know, it's been really the creative juices have been, They've been invigorated for me because I just feel it's like I'm so clear on the absolute gift it is to get to make this your work, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like it excites me to connect with someone on Zoom and be like, ooh, I get to like talk with them for an hour and a half and ask them <laughs> questions and see what kind of tape we make, you know? And 
yeah, after making a show for 10 years, that's that excitement wasn't always there. It was sort of, you know, and the pandemic was hard. Everything was hard. Um, so I did. I think I'm like refreshed, which is good. Edisale, thank you so much for being all working. Thanks for having me. Up next, Ronald and I will talk about having conversations about what really matters, how to figure out what really matters, and thinking about what you'd change about your work if a big project was cancelled. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Whether you're driving, cooking, or doing laundry, Progressive knows the podcasts you listen to go best when they're bundled with another activity, much like how their progressive home and auto policies go best when they're bundled. Having these two policies together makes taking care of your insurance easier and could help you save, too. Customers who save by switching their home and car insurance to Progressive save nearly $800 on average. That's a whole lot of savings and protection for your favorite podcast listening activities, like going on a road trip cooking dinner, and even hitting the gym. Yep, your home and your car are even easier to protect when you bundle your insurance together. Find your perfect combo. Get a home and car insurance quote at Progressive.com today. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $793 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Ronald, I absolutely loved that interview. It was so grounded and, I guess for me at least, practical. One of the threads that ran through so many of Anna's answers was the idea of figuring out what you really care about, what you're good at, and what you really want to do with that skill. That came through in your question about honing an interview style And Anna's saying basically that she realized that she wanted to be asking the same kinds of profound questions of politicians that she was expected to ask voters that she interviewed on the trail. And that comes through so strongly in that image of Anna sitting on the floor in the Anthony Weiner press conference asking herself, what is the real question here? What is this really about? And Like many people who are really good at something, she made it seem easier than most of us find it. Ronald, this is something you're pretty good at yourself. What have (laughs) you learned about getting to the core question, the what's this really about? You know, it's funny because I think about it as the question behind the question. And I've Mm. frustrated friends and romantic partners (laughs) with this because sometimes they'll ask me a question and I'll I'll sense that it is a pre-question before they get to their actual question. And I'll they'll ask this pre-question and I'll just be like, What's the actual question? So they'll be like, it'll be something like, Hey, so uh what were you did were you were you thinking about eating something today? And I'm like, What do you what do you ask you when I ask me? They're like, Well, where do you want to eat? Like, just say that to me instead of having the pre-question. And I feel like that's the mindset that I have interviews in where I say like, let's just get to the bottom of this. Like there's a lot of ways. And I think sometimes depending on what subjects you're talking to, there's a lot of ways in which you kind of need to take a different route into and be a little bit more sensitive going into Mm -hmm. like a question or trying to get an inquiry, whatever you're trying to get back from the subject. But in most cases, like just get to the bottom line. And that's kind of how I think about it. What is the question behind the question? Oh, that is deep. I think it's also important to say here that although we've been talking about these kinds of real talk conversations in a journalistic or a podcasting context, this isn't just a professional project. The underlying philosophy applies to having all types of conversations in life, whether that's in a work context, figuring out what you need to do in your job, what's up with your coworkers, or what your friends are really asking you when they're making small talk, (laughs) you know, getting beyond the superficial when talking with loved ones. So Figuring out how to talk about big life questions is a skill that really does confer superpowers, right? I think it's just if you have a curiosity about life that is beyond, Mm. you know, kind of the facade that we put up when you go to a party, because like when really when you go to a party, we're talking about weather or the news. (laughs) 
what we're really doing is feeling each other out to see where we connect, to see what's yeah. going on. You know what I mean? And I think in some cases, when you know someone already, if you start with a friend group that you already know, if you start with a bunch of work people, you kind of already know what those places are. So you kind of go straight to those places. Hey, y'all all watch the West Wing, right? Let's talk about the West <laughs> Wing. You know what I mean? And I yeah. think like, especially in the last like maybe eight to 10, maybe 16 years, it's been increasingly difficult to find out what we connect with each other on. Mm. So mm. I feel like, and you, and you, there's so many landmines now where it's like nope can't talk it used to be like just politics and religion now it's like politics religion sexuality food even uh, the weather yeah weather dietary restrictions whatever you know what i mean so it's like trying to figure out like how we could get to those one i would say connections not just big life questions but how are we getting to those connecting factors and how can we get there more quickly and i think that is a superpower because you really have to as they say read the room you know yeah yeah for real i mean we both work in podcasting though so let's also talk about some of the inside baseball things that Anna said I was laughing along to your conversation about how you both immediately move into ask them questions mode with people (laughs) who come up to you to talk about your work for the record I do exactly the same thing yeah as she said though audio people don't get to see their work land it's not like a playwright or a movie maker hearing an audience respond That's not unique, of course, but it does feel different to say writing because radio, podcasting, it's such an intimate medium. You're in my head, Ronald. How am I supposed to stay neutral about that? So what have you learned about how people respond to your work from your in-person interactions with listeners? I find that, you know, they say just like in a survey, the only people that respond to surveys are people who feel either really strongly positively or really strongly negatively about yeah. something. And yeah. I've, I've, I've been lucky enough to only experience people who are responding very positively to mm. my work, uh, mm. which is good. There have been yeah. a few times, though, when I've been in the car with a friend or something, and I've just gotten in the car with them when they were listening to an episode of mm. a podcast, and I've been like, nah, you got to change this, because I can't <laughs> I can't watch you listen to this, because as, as rewarding as it w- may be to see someone enjoy it, like to be in the car with someone, like the anxiety that happens as yeah. they are consuming the work is pretty tough to kind of for me to manage but that being said knowing that somebody went off listened to it and then when they respond with feedback or they just kind of respond as if we're both listening at the same time and just kind of like respond to what i said in the show but they say it to me that always it feels good just to know that people are listening so for me I, i feel like just having people respond at all is is just heartwarming to me, period. Like, yeah. even if they're listening to, like, episodes of Working where we're just doing interviews, you know what yeah. I mean? It's still nice to hear people be like, oh, yeah, that thing you did with Linda Holmes, I love Linda Holmes. This yeah. was, that was yeah. pretty good. So it always feels yeah. good to hear it. Yeah, for real. You know, something you said about being in a car and, you know, wanting to avoid that. There is, so my <laughs> partner was a therapist and she says you should never have tough conversations over a meal or in a car and you know like you you there are certain times where you want to focus on getting your nutrition focus on the on the road yeah Uh, you can have those deep in-depth uh and a sale type conversations somewhere else yeah Um, agreed (laughs) i was also really struck by the conversation about the thinking anna did during that period when Death, Sex, and Money was canceled by WNYC and before it was picked up by Slit. Mm -hmm. In many ways, the ideal time to do that kind of exercise is when it still is an exercise, you know, when Mm -hmm. you still have a paycheck coming in. But listening to that exchange, I could really see the value of asking myself, if this project that I spend most of my professional life thinking about and working on were canceled, what would I want to preserve of it? What parts would I be happy to lose? And what would I try to do differently? It was wonderful to hear that Anna felt that the show that she has been working on for a decade has been evolving in such a way that it didn't feel stale and in need of radical reinvention. But thinking that through, doing that exercise seems really useful. Is that something you've done at any point in your career? Well, I think... You know, whenever I think about a transition, I always think about the fact that most transitions I have resisted. 
Yes. I've always gone against the momentum. Like I'm, something is pushing me in a direction. I'm like, I don't want to go in that direction. <laughs> and even though whatever direction it's pushing me towards is probably somewhere I actually want it to go. But mm. when it's time to actually move in that direction, it's tricky. But what you find is that like when you're pushed out, when the show is canceled, when you're fired, when you're laid off, whatever, you really are forced into these moments of deep reflection where you're really thinking like, hey, what is next? What do I want to do? What does this sudden amount of free time mean for me? What are my necessities? What do I need to account for immediately right now? What do I have to be dealing with right in front of my face? Like you kind of have to triage your life in that way. Yeah, I think that time of transitional reflection is important, but if we could get ahead of it, If we could have a plan, if we could like look at all of our projects and say, what is the exit strategy for this project Mm, mm. under my own terms, under my own control, we might not feel as panicked or have so much anxiety in those moments when we do push out and have to have that transitional reflection. So Mm. I I think it's it's worth thinking about before the transition happens, um, but there is still value in the transitional reflection itself. Yeah, for real. I've always been envious of those people who talk about being fun employed, which I guess is when (laughs) a job ends and you know you have another one lined up and you have that period. I've never had that. It it sounds really great, but I have a feeling that I'm much too anxious to enjoy that. But June, that's like an adult summer break if you think about it. Because if you (laughs) know, know, like think about it, if you know another job is it's lined up, you're good. You have like two to three weeks off. It's like, oh, let's do nothing. Let's not be responsible. Let's not raise kids. This is summer (laughs) break. This might never happen again. (laughs) Yeah. And you know what? You won't even have to write uh, what I did during my summer vacation report nope. on your first nope. day back. It's gonna be you don't amazing. have to read one book, June. Sorry, I know you're an author. <laughs> you don't have to read one book. Yeah, do you read <laughs> yeah, one, yeah. but only one. And let only, it be one. Mine. only one. Only <laughs> one. Well, that's all the time we have this week. We hope you've enjoyed the show. And if you have, please remember to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. That way you will never miss an episode. And just a reminder that by joining Slate Plus, you get ad-free podcasts, extra segments on shows like Slow Burn, and you will never hit a paywall on the Slate site. To learn more, go to slate.com slash working plus. Thank you so much to our dear friend, Anna Sale, and to producer Cameron Drews. We'll be back next week with June's conversation with writer Anne Lamott. Until then, get back to work. We've all been there. You have a question about your credit card. You call the number for help and can't get a hold of anyone. If only you had a Discover card. With 24-7 US-based live customer service from Discover, everyone has the option to talk to a real person anytime, day or night. Yep, you heard that right. A real person. Get the customer service you deserve with Discover. Limitations apply. See terms at discover.com slash credit card. Pulling up to Mickey D's just for drinks? Oh yeah, that's me. Nothing extra, just perfection and a straw. Coming in hot for the coldest cups on the block. Because there are drinks. Then there are drinks from McDonald's. Ever combine an ice cold frozen Coke with piping hot fries? Try frozen drinks any size for $1.49. Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba.